And uh, going into the 1980s with this agricultural crisis, things were very tough because uh, for those of you who were alive, you'll remember that uh, gas prices, fuel prices were very expensive and that a lot of the chemicals used in farming are based on uh, um, fossil fuels. And it was very difficult both to sell grains and to farm and actually make a living. And there was also kind of a new mood in the country amongst uh, the largest industrial leaders. They saw the future and themselves as multinational companies. And they wanted to change the policies that they viewed as holding them back. And some of these um, economic interests did get together and uh, raise a lot of money. It wasn't just the food industry. It was uh, the oil and gas industry and a number of other industries. And they were able to raise a lot of money to get their candidate elected uh, president and elected on the promise of a lot of deregulation. And that was, of course, um, uh, President Reagan. And one of the, th the uh, top policies on their list to change were the laws that prevent companies, competitors, from merging and acquiring one another. And the excuse at that time was in part, well, we need to be competitive with Japan. We need to get bigger. You know, we need to be too big to fail. They didn't use those words, but kind of the same, uh, same idea. And so in writing Foodopoly, I had the opportunity to interview uh, one of the commissioners at the Federal Trade Commission at that time. And of course, you probably know there are two main agencies that oversee uh, the policies around uh, antitrust. That's uh, the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice. So uh, this commissioner, whose name is Michael Perchuk, is uh, retired in the Southwest today. But he told me about um, the antitrust enforcement after the uh, 1940s, in fact, during the end of the 1940s, into and through the 1970s, we had a fairly vigorous antitrust enforcement program. And in fact, both political parties were uh, in agreement that antitrust enforcement was a good thing and that competition is a good thing. Um, isn't our economic system built on the idea of competition, right? Well. Um, so when the uh, Reagan administration came into office at the Federal Trade Commission, the appointee's name was James Miller. And he did what you would expect if you want to eviscerate a set of policies. Came in, dramatically cut the budget, got rid of whole departments and a lot of staff, allowed practices that had been frowned upon in the past, like allowing direct competitors to merge or acquire one another. And I think most importantly, severely narrowed the definition of what an antitrust violation is. And so today, we have this very narrow definition. And we also uh, have very poor enforcement of what's left of uh, um, those policies and around the uh, weak definition. So this has uh, had a dramatic effect on our society. What happens when companies get very, very, very large? Well, they have a lot of resources, right? They have a lot more money. And so in the 1980s, we began to see a real change in our political system as companies began to use their uh, excess resources to uh, influence legislation and uh, regulatory policies. And it was really the beginning of what I always like to call our system of legalized bribery, where we don't really have uh, uh, policies that are based on what's best for people, but uh, are really influenced by the companies who will benefit from weakening them. And this has had a... Uh, uh, a especially important effect on a lot of the trade policies. Now, one of the things I learned when I was reading these documents 
from the um, Committee for Economic Development is after their 1962 report on farm policy, two years later they wrote a report on trade policy. And in that report they basically laid out a lot of um, the parameters by which they thought the trade should be done. And you know, trade's a good thing, right? We've always had trade. But today we have a kind of trade that's uh, really beneficial to the largest economic interests. And when you look at the, the policies that came to be uh, our public policies under the World Trade Organization and trade agreements like NAFTA and all of the agreements since then, you can really see the roots of them in this report written in 1964, even uh, down to uh, recommending that investors can sue governments over uh, protective measures that they take for their uh, people. Now, I, I'm recounting this story because at the end of the, the 1980s, we were really in a period where uh, a lot of trade negotiations were going on, and some of the largest economic uh, interests in the country got together to influence the way different trade policies uh, were determined. And the grain trader Cargill, uh, which you're, most of you are probably familiar with, one of the largest uh, food processors and uh, grain traders in the world, I think the largest grain trader, um, put together a coalition of about 100 food-related companies. This was uh, a uh, kind of a groundbreaking thing because these food companies had never really worked uh, this closely together. And they debated amongst themselves the policies that would benefit the industry. And of course, some of these companies had opposing interests. But they came out with a, a set of policies that they agreed upon. And then Cargill uh, did a lot of the lobbying and actually was responsible largely for writing the agreement on agriculture under the World Trade Organization. Now, this was really important because to uh, um, to get this kind of model of trade going, it was also necessary, these companies believed, to rewrite what was left of the farm policies from the 1930s. And so there was a lot of lobbying to write a farm bill in 1996 that would match the policies in the, uh, uh, the World Trade Agreement and, and NAFTA. And so uh, they did this. It was called Freedom to Farm. And uh, you know, it's always scary when freedom is attached to uh, any uh, piece of legislation, right, and for the uh, for <laughs> Congress. And um, this um, legislation did indeed pass, and it did away with it. Eliminated all of the last vestiges of uh, those 1930s. Uh, farm programs, so a complete deregulation of any supply management function of the USDA. They got, they got rid of the uh, grain reserve, and uh, it was basically uh, uh, exactly the policies that Cargill, the grocery industry, the largest food processors, had been lobbying for. And um, this has had a very dramatic effect on our food system, because within two years, the uh, price of corn had plummeted by 50%. The price of soy plummeted by 40%. And that meant that uh, farmers were uh, uh, once again not able to make the cost of production, and we lost a lot of uh, farms. So Congress, you know, often uh, not willing to actually deal with the real problems, uh, decided during this period in 1998 that they would use taxpayer money to basically make it possible for farmers to continue producing grains, but that um, it would um, you know, be a kind of a subsidy to allow overproduction because this was what the, the largest food processors and grain traders wanted. They wanted cheap grains because they are the biggest beneficiaries of having too many commodities, things like corn and soy. 
So before I talk about the whole subsidy issue, I want to talk about the companies that have benefited the most from uh, this system where for years we had overproduction of um, the basic commodities that are the components of many of the foods that Americans eat today because Americans spend about 90% of their grocery dollars on processed food and more than 70% of that food uh, is probably really bad for you and one of the components is uh, from the commodities, you know, it's fat, sugar, uh, or salt, right? Mm -hmm.